stuff. You know, you better hide some of this stuff. These guys like to take it back and use it for their next <coughs> team. Dick, tell her food is what we're after. <laughs> food is what he's after. It's nice, isn't it? Yeah, real nice. Because I asked him the same thing. I said, it's the first time I've ever been in one. Well, me too. I they have one in Myrtle Beach. Yeah. And I, I made a pact with myself that I was going to get me a job when I got to be 85. 85. 85. Yeah. And I mentioned that. You're working on that. I'm working on that. <laughs> Send out for extra makeup for me and Steve. Oh, yeah. If they got, a lot. If they got some color back, I swear that would be my I think so too. That's what the rouge. She looks so pretty. <laughs> What are, you, what are you going to do about uh, Beatty there on top? I got, I mean, she can't do much about me now. Yeah, put that bombing fluid on me. <laughs> That's right. Judy, you look beautiful. I've heard it. You're, you're not proposing, are you? <laughs> no, I'm not proposing at all. <laughs> you got a nurse home or what? What are you doing, Doc? Well, I, well, see, I figured I said, they well, I knew mean, Bobby would be the last one here. They get you out of nurse home or what? <laughs> I we had a I told everybody an hour ago, I said, the last person walking that door is going to be Bobby Allen. Well, I said, when he dies, they're going to have to hold the funeral up 30 minutes for him well, to get there. So he's going to be guy, late. The guy out there <laughs> thought I was somebody got my autograph. <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait I'm until thinking. Red Line is his lips from me. <laughs> so I spoke to you about that kind of stuff. We've got to have to tell some stories on TV in here now. Oh, yeah. So yeah. we can tell, so we can. Are y'all taping? Am I at the right place? Am I right place? And every race driver I've ever met is a pretty good storyteller. They learned that in self-defense. I think. I look okay? Yeah. I think I look pretty good. I think my wife would be proud. My children. Mom and Dad. Michael, my brother. I think everybody, I don't think I look real good. I think compared to the other guys. <laughs> Here we go. Welcome to that fast car cafe in Nashville, Tennessee. What would happen if you put together the guys that built the cars with the guys that drove the cars, with the inspector that tore down the cars, with the writers that wrote about it, and the announcers that announced it? You're about to go behind the scenes and hear the stories directly from the legends that lived them. These are the guys that made racing what it is today. Let's walk through the tunnel and join 24 stock car racing legends. Hey, I've heard y'all have to drive here. Not too much. But I ain't got to. We have a long way. It's a long way from coming. Baker, you got one? Oh, yeah. We used to have a crew chief named Brad Hagler, and nicest guy in the world, and he worked so very hard all the time. But every time he'd win a race, man, he would just couldn't help it. He had to have something to drink, and a lot of it. So, <laughs> Daddy won a race in Columbia one night, and Chick Morris had a, he, I don't think he ever drove to and from the racetrack. He didn't fall asleep somewhere on the way, but he told my dad after the race, he said, look here, I'm all fresh, I'm all keyed up because we won the race, I'm really happy. I guarantee you, I can drive the car home tonight, tow this race car behind me, and everything will be great. And Dad said, well, okay, put Brad in the back seat, because he's already lit up. He, he's just happier and can be. Well, I didn't believe him we beat everybody that bad. <laughs> anyway, he got in the back seat, he kind of goes to sleep, and Chick goes about 45 miles, falls asleep, runs off the bank, turns both cars over, and when they get all stopped, he said, Brad took the seat and pushed it off of him and said, <clears throat> Can, can we get a beer here? <laughs> <laughs> Dick, tell the, Dick, tell the story that you told at Buck Bergance's memorial deal there. Uh, it's not cars, it's motorcycle related. Yeah. Uh, that was a great story. <clears throat> Many years ago, I raced motorcycles. And in 1952, we... Yeah, it was. <laughs> we went to Richmond. Buck Bergance, a very good friend of mine who passed away a while back. And uh, we went to Richmond, run, run a race. On the way home, we got to South Boston. And a car coming north run into us head on. And I went through the windshield. 
Buck was behind me. I think he pushed me through the windshield because I beat him that day. And then a car hit us in the back. It knocked us on down the road. We went down the bankman and all that stuff. And it never did knock me out, but I felt up there, and I didn't have no damn nose. <laughs> <laughs> and I felt over here, and this eye was all not the way it's supposed to be. And I'm sitting there, and I, I, I'm bleeding every time my heart pumps, blood splashes out. And here comes Buck. He come down, he grabbed that door, and he jerked it open. He says, Dick, Dick. Come help me find my motorcycle. <laughs> I said, you son of a bitch, you find my nose, I'll find it. <laughs> and he never did find it. Uh, no, 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 I finally found it, had to put it back on. I just want to tell you a quick story about Ed and Agree. He was uh, going to California and he stopped at a truck stop, you know, and his wife got out, went to the restroom. So he goes, heads on back down the road, and a guy calls in on the CB and says, uh, hey, you hear about that uh, guy leaving his wife up to the truck stop? And <laughs> he pulls the curtain back. She wasn't back there. <laughs> hey, Brian, tell the story. I was just sitting here looking at, at Pearson here, one of the greatest winners, greatest qualifiers. Tell that story about Bristol when Bobby Isaac messed with him during his qualifying run. He'll deny it, but... <laughs> uh, back in the early days of Bristol, they had a lot of bushes down in turns one and two and three and four. They had what they called alder bushes, kind of a swamp. They got ready to go out and qualify. Pearson went out early and qualified, set a pretty good time. Back in those days, you could, whenever you got ready to qualify, NASCAR would just shut the track down and you go out and qualify. Well, it got a little bit cloudy later in the afternoon, and Isaac was getting ready to go, and he'd been running a little bit faster than David had. So David didn't want to lose the pole. So when Isaac got ready to go, Pearson went over in the back stretch down in turn four and hid in them bushes. Well, Isaac takes the green, comes flying down the back straightaway, and David steps out on the edge of the racetrack, and he's waving like so. So Isaac naturally backed out of it, come on around, won't ask NASCAR what was going on. They said, nothing. Well, what, what, what are you talking about? And he said, well, somebody stepped out on the apron of the track and slowed me down. And, and I want to go again. They said, no, you can't go again. And he, it took him about an hour to figure out it was David. David hid. <laughs> <laughs> now, wouldn't he usually pull up next to you on the racetrack and tell you to slow down and stuff? Yeah, Darlington one year was uh, running Leo Jackson's car in the spring here in the bush race. <laughs> and I was leading the race. And uh, I was in pretty good shape, you know. And I look in the mirror to see where Pearson was. He was running second. And uh, we got the white flag, and I thought I had him beat. I get looking in the mirror watching Pearson. I drive into the third turn a little bit hard. And, of course, everybody knows that Darlington, you know, if you run the third and fourth corner really fast, that's where you make your time. That's where you made your mistake. Right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I go in there, you know, a little too fast and, and get a little high, and, of course, Pearson gets a good run at me and beats me to the flag stand and wins the race. So when we went back that fall, believe me, I, I had my mind made up I was going to lap David Pearson. And I lapped him, got by him, and then a caution come out, and I slowed down, and he pulls up alongside of me, and he's like, slow down, slow down, slow down. I said, the hell with you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I won that race in the fall. You didn't do that, David, did you? You didn't do any of these things these guys are saying? No, they lying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you one about uh, David and Baker was running over there. You know, Baker, he gets a little bit nervous sometimes during the race. <laughs> <laughs> So David, he got all lined up, you know, and he got it, had his cigarette light in the car, and he got all lined up, and so when he pay, he went, goes by David down the front, I mean, uh, Baker down the front stretch, lights a cigarette just as he goes by. He didn't have to worry about Buddy no more. Than <laughs> 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 let me, let me yeah, wait a minute. I'll be with him with him to go at Charlotte. He, he was smoking that cigarette. That was his mistake. <laughs> I'll tell you one time at uh, Daytona, I was on the same radio frequency with him, and he didn't know it, you know. So he's at Daytona, and I was following him, wrapped him behind Buddy, you know. We were going along, and I think Benny or somebody was running third. And they was getting close on me. I said, step on it, buddy. I said, they're catching us. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Baker, Baker, he's at uh, Martinsville, you know, and, and he gets a little excited, like he said, especially on Sunday. And uh, he's on pole. I was on the outside pole. And every week, I mean, no matter where we went, it's when he's driving a 28 car. He, he was always getting mad at somebody. So I, I went over to him before the race car, and I said, now look, buddy, I said, you got a fast car this week, and you can win this race. I said, but you got to settle down on it. I'm telling him. This is me telling him. You got to take it easy on these 
in the early going and don't tear your car up. Don't get so upset. I said, it's a short track. We're going to run over each other. Go bump in. So don't get upset. He said, you're right. I'm not going to get upset today. I'm going to drive this car. I'm going to mind my own business, and I'm not going to get upset. So we're coming out. We get in the cars. We're going around on the parade lap. Everybody's swerving their tires. Somebody bumped into Buddy, and here he is. He got that arm. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't even took the green flag yet, and he's got that arm out the window, taking that fist. Let me tell you the funniest thing ever happened to me. You know, you've heard different drivers say they heard a voice during a race. Yeah. Well, one day, I'm in Daytona, and this car that I'm driving is just doing everything wrong. And I heard this, I'm loose. <laughs> I went, there it is. <laughs> it's, it's in here. I don't know who it is. I'm loose. And I went, well, so am I. <laughs> then I realized that I was on Harry Gant's frequency. <laughs> we were at Martinsville. Junior might remember this. Harold Kinder. We was working on the car Sunday morning. We always do a radio check, you know, check all the radios. And uh, Junior was working on the car, and I was in the car, had my helmet on, I was checking my radio. About that time, I said, uh, uh, I said, check, radio check, and everybody was checking in. About that time, I said, hey, somebody's on my radio frequency. I said, who is that? This is Kingsport. I said, Kingsport? What in the world is Kingsport? I said, Junior, everybody, I said, everybody check your radio. Something's going on here. So checking, checking, checking. And what happened is Harold Kinder had come over and got one of our radios, and he was hiding over behind the truck. <laughs> and he was, and, and I told him, I said, Junior, come on, some cab driver or something's got on our radio. <laughs> They're going to screw us up today. And it was Harold Kinder, and then we finally saw him over in the NASCAR truck just to no, have him just No, you laugh. didn't. Junior did. Junior saw You him. took your helmet off, went running to Junior, and gave to Junior. Junior put the helmet on. He just looked around. He yeah. knew what the hell was happening. <laughs> Y'all seen Daryl? Oh, Daryl was jumping up and down. Oh, Henry yeah, Benfield was, was checking out all the radios. You know how you lay them out, check them out. He he called old Daryl and no Daryl called in or Henry yeah. called Daryl and said, "How's your radio? Get off this radio. This is Kingsport." <laughs> then Daryl jerked that thing off. God, he got nervous, more nervous than Buddy does when he qualifies. <laughs> couple of names we haven't mentioned yet. Cuckoo Marlin and uh, Hoss Ellington. Uh -huh. <laughs> tell us that, tell us a story. Well, I want, my wife was driving us. Which one, Talladega story or the other one? Yeah. Talladega yeah. Talladega. Talladega. And, uh, Talladega. She never drove no car with up and down wonders and this and that. And she came back to the motel and she got stopped. <laughs> and the car up there. And my wife couldn't get the window down. She'd punch this, she'd punch that, the seat go up, the seat go back, go up, <laughs> down. <laughs> and it finally went on, and Hoss reached over there and punched the button, and it went down. So she made my wife get out, and I carried her back there. The Hoss told me, they're making her blow in a hat. I said, get out. And first thing you know, here's two, three more cars. Cars and Halston got out. Then police trying to push him back in the car. I just sitting in there. Halston said, "Get out! Let's whoop him." <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got out, and they got. Of course, my wife checked out. Right. Carried us to jail. <laughs> and of course, Halston he could just go sleep anywhere, but uh, he kept hearing the racket. I had my boots off and had a tin can and kept beating it on the floor with my boots. I was trying to make a key to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you one about it. Marty Robin. One night I hear, of course, Marty had one of Cotton Owens Hemis, pretty strong. Of course, I had a big block shovel up. And I got to jump on him on the start and got in front. And we hadn't run free left. Marty spun me. We didn't put out no caution flag. I spin it around. I saw Marty going through the other corner. I took off. I got trying to find him, and I couldn't see him. I keep getting faster and faster, and finally my boys was waving their hands, and I just kept getting faster. And finally, the boy just threw it up his hand, walked off. When the race was over, I didn't lap on the field. Marty Riley made two laps, and he went to Grand Ole Opry. <laughs> 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 I still looking for him he on the racetrack. <laughs> Fun cuckoo out and left. <laughs> you were going to tell us a story earlier. I think it was about kale, and we kind of we had to stop tape or something. Did you have a story earlier in the day? Well, it's talking about kale beating, banging on people, and yeah. how he yeah. turned red. 
<laughs> Ned Jarrett had put this race on in uh, Metrolina. I don't know if you remember that deal or not. And uh, got down about three laps to go, and Kel was there. We was rubbing around, beating around. We both got down in the corner and spin. So Ned carried me up there. We was doing a thing after the race, and I won the race. Looked up, and here come Kel up in the little tower down there. He was as red as a beet. His old veins sticking out, and I said, Lord, we're going to have a big fight right here. <laughs> Turn around. He said, boy, what happened to you? I said, I lost the brakes, Kel. And the next week, he, I think he used it on Buddy up at Bristol. Yeah. He, <laughs> he had the worst brakes in NASCAR, didn't he? <laughs> I'd just like to tell you one about Hoss. Uh, he had Fred Lorenzen driving for him. And uh, they, uh, he takes the car out of Atlanta, shakes it down. Freddie comes back in. He says, she's just right, man. Says, she, says, my grandmother could drive this thing. So they get on during the race, and he begins to go farther and farther back. About midway of the race, Hoss comes running up to Glenn and I, and he says, uh, you didn't have any chance to get his grandmother's number, did you? <laughs> Marcus, tell them, tell them about the, our racing here in Nashville. We had some pretty heated battles there for a while. Yeah, uh, uh, when Mr. Donahoe was promoting that racetrack, uh, I was driving a, a, a Dodge Charger out of Suburbial, Tennessee, and um, uh, we decided we was going to come and run some short track races here in Nashville. And of course, Darrell was the, the king there, I guess, at the racetrack at Nashville. And, and uh, we'd come in there a couple times with that Dodge and, and beat him. And, uh, uh, the fellow he was driving for, I guess Doc was his name. Doc Brewington. Yeah, Doc and Brewington. Uh, uh, it got to be such a heated thing and a weekly thing that, uh, like one night they told Daryl, they said, if, if you let Marcus get underneath you, you're going to lose the ride. And we were taking you out of the race car because if you don't let him get under you, then he can't beat you. Well, you couldn't pry him off the bottom line that night. So I actually would beat him worse on the outside because old Dodge run better. It was freer up there, you know. But after the race, they decide that they're going to destroy us guys with this Dodge. They tear the engine apart. They take, they protest the carburetor. Now, this is a little bit of the old 30-lap race, right? 30 lap feature, yeah. And, but and of course, big deal. Uh, Doc worked for a beer distributor. <laughs> yeah, Fall and, City Beer was a sponsor. And we was making, we was tearing our engine apart and making side bets, drinking his beer. We were sitting, we were sitting in Victory Circle. We bring in the coolers, and it was a planned deal. And, and Doc's theory was this Hemi. He had this Hemi motor in there. He said, if they take that big thing apart, they'll never get it back together. <laughs> if we ever get them tore down, if we tear them apart, I guarantee it'll never run that good again. So that was his theory. So they bring in all the beer, and we'd all sit, Dave, and all of us just sitting there and drink beer and watch them tear the motor down and bet with us, legal, illegal, gas tank, fuel, whatever. Yeah, we, we was making side bets. I mean, it got to the point where everybody was drinking so much, like I told Doc, I said, Doc, he said, I'm protesting the carburetor. I said, I'll bet you a couple hundred bucks it's legal. He said, that's a bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so when it got all done, I mean, this is a 30-lap race. He protested the fuel cell. <laughs> In a 30-lap race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they took the fuel cell out and checked it and drained it, and it was okay. But when we left her that night, we had, I guess we probably had five or $6,000. We won 30. the race, we beat all the protests and all the side bets. I mean, we left out a <laughs> pretty good pile of money. Yeah. <laughs> but the funny thing, everybody was happy. How did yeah. you run the next week? We had it back together. Yep. And it would come and back. Again. And I believe we won the race again next he week. He beat us two weeks in a row. <laughs> and tear him down a second time? And then we had to get a, we had to get a new motor then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we tore him down again. <laughs> Let me tell you one on Bobby Allison and... Darrell Waltrip. Oh, this could be ugly. <laughs> in 1988 at Riverside, we know, but the people out there don't know. Riverside's got S's going up through there. And Bobby's leading Darrell up through there. And Darrell kind of... Well, I was in a hurry. <laughs> I was in a kind of a hurry. Anyhow, anyhow he kind of punted. You know how you punt a football? Bobby went him. down through there, wow, wow, wow. Dust, dirt, you couldn't see anything. So the race got over. Bobby, hot, very hot. But he said nothing during, uh, that afternoon. The next week was in Pocono. And I started the driver's meeting, and Bobby said just a few words. Bob says, what you going to do about that damn wall trip? 
spinning me. Mark, Michael walked up, jumped up, said, it wasn't me, it was my brother. <laughs> Remember that, Bobby? That kind of broke it up right there. Well, see, the whole deal was it was the last race at Riverside, and he wanted to win it, and I wanted to win it, and we were running good. I mean, we probably one of us probably could have won it. <laughs> but I was in, he was in front of me, and I was just trying to pass him, you know, and we got together. Instead, you dropped <laughs> over instead of around, though. That was the problem. <laughs> well, the road's narrow out there, you know. Yo, it's a narrow road. Is that what it is? Bobby can't say what nothing. Did they, Man, he, he. That's right. What they need to do, uh, do a little uh, legalized stuff. I remember back in, years ago, back in Birmingham on a restart, I come by, and I think it's Donnie. I'm not sure behind me. had a faster car, but I could handle a little bit better. And on a restart, I was scared that I was going to get jumped. It come by, and the flagman signaled one more lap to go. So we put our hand out the window to let them know to restart the next lap. They come around the next lap, come off four turn. I stood on the gas and jumped them. The car behind me didn't go. And I won the race. They come over and said, why come you signaling me two laps to go? When you didn't have a one lap to go, I said, you wrong. Two halves, that's one <laughs> lap to go. <laughs> I just put them out the window and stopped the goal. And I just <laughs> Only track where they were putting the printed uh, rules. It says, turn left at the end of the straightaway and don't try and pass red on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's right there in the rule book. Yeah. Talk a little bit about some of the spectacular wrecks we've seen over the years. I know a lot of people wonder how Dick Brooks gained so much weight. <laughs> Dick gained it in that bad, bad wreck he had at Talladega. I don't remember what year it was. He but talked to us through that on the radio that but, day. But remember the that? car flipped and <clears throat> yeah. several times down the back straightaway. It had been raining all night, all kinds of mud on the apron of the racetrack. No car gets out there and starts scooting down the back stretch, and here comes all this mud in through the windshield, just like a bulldozer. Mm -hmm. Tell them you can finish the story because you were absolutely covered up in mud. The uniform was full. Everything else was. Well, we had. That's kind of a, kind of a long story. Where all it started. Talking about Haas Ellington and, and, uh, and uh, Donnie, who was driving for Haas at the time. And Baker was running uh, Bud's car, I think. <clears throat> and we'd started back quite a ways back in the pack. But we were hooked up. I mean, hooked up. Baker was, Baker and I both was hooked up. And we'd run that lap about, I don't know, 218, 220 or something, 213 or something like that for that lap that, would, that this happened on. So we'd came all the way from 10th to 12th. And, and it was on a restart, I think, and it would run two or three laps after that. And so here we go. Well, Baker goes by. I think uh, Donnie was either leading the race or somebody was in front of him. Baker was the second or third car back, and I was behind him. So when we go by, and they'd taken NASCAR at that time was messing with their spoilers. You know, these guys today talk about taking air off of these spoilers and stuff. Hell, we didn't have no spoilers to take the air off of. It took off the whole car if we lost air, you know. We, we, we didn't have any of that. So, and they had, uh, and they were trying to get the car slowed down. And... Uh, and they had taken the, the front spoiler, and the only thing we had was the, the center of the frame rails, if I'm not right, at that time. And it had to be four or six inches off the ground. It wasn't, you know, it was just regular bumpers and stuff, so there wasn't any air dams up there. And the cars get real light. And uh, so anyway, Buddy goes by, Donnie or whoever was, whoever was leading the thing at that time, goes by him and he turns in, and I come right on in. Well, as Donnie goes in, my car wiggles like this just a little bit, and I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I hit him or did whatever, but anyway, I just took off. I went straight up, and the car did two and a half rolls backwards and then hit, and then it started rolling forward. Well, <clears throat> and I remember thinking, when you're going along and everything's going, and it just gets real quiet. I mean, there's not a sound of anything. And I remember grabbing the bottom steering wheel saying, God, this is going to be bad. I mean, just knowing that this is going to, you know, I was higher in the grandstand. Well, we rolled along, and it had been raining over there, and it rolled like 16 times, I think, they've counted on the tapes and stuff. And every time it went in that mud, it just picked up a bigger, bigger pile of mud. <laughs> well, <clears throat> the car uh, uh, was, just, was just packed with mud, and every hole I had was full of mud. I mean, <laughs> everything. <laughs> I never got all that stuff washed off. But uh, when that thing stopped, you know, go ahead and talk about the, uh, the equipment we had in those days. When that thing stopped, it left the it left, uh, ground uh, just after you come off the second turn, and it hit the gate going into the third turn, which is about 3,000 feet down through there. That's how far it rolled. And when it stopped, I couldn't believe it. I just could not believe it had gone that far, and I just knew I was dead. And, and how do you know what's happening when you're dead? You know, you might be able to see stuff. You don't know it. You don't know whether you're or not. But it had to be dead rolling along that far, so. 
So I'm sitting there trying to <laughs> trying to get everything together, you know, and trying to make sure that you always hear somebody punches your lung or something like that. And uh, so I'm trying to get everything together, and these guys are in around the net. We had nets in those, in those days, but the guy's in around the net with a pocket knife. He's trying to cut the seat belt, and there's another guy come through the window. The windshield's gone. Guy comes through the window, and he's pulling on the harness, just trying to get us out. And I kept telling him, I said, just leave me alone. Just leave me alone now, just for a minute. Just leave me alone. I want to sit here and just think about this for a minute. Well, they kept on and kept on. So finally, I listened the belt loose. And this guy over here jumped back, and he says, boy, that's the way that works, huh? <laughs> and, the guy, and the guy in the front was still pulling on me, and I hit him like this. And I said, just leave me alone. I want to sit here a minute. We get out, finally get out of the car, and they got me in a U-Haul or a Ryder van with a cot, an Army cot in the back of it. And that's what we're going to ambulance in. To the, and that's the ambulance we're going to hospital in. And they go around, and everybody sitting here knows how you get up into the, into the hospital at Talladega. You got a, you got a bad turn. You got to turn back in. Well, they went right on by down to pit road. The guy driving the thing hauling me out of the car that was trying to drag me out didn't even know how to get to the, <laughs> to the hospital. He was going on down the hill. So times have changed with, the, with equipment, right? You talk about those guys today that, that uh, driving these things and they got to have all these safety equipment and all that stuff. We survived all that stuff. Well, great pictures of you and, and Ned you know, with the, the T-shirt, and, uh, and that was about it. Eli, let me add to that little story right there because I happen to be one involved with it. But uh, Buddy did come by, and Brooks, and Brooks, Brooks and I did get together. I got into his right rear or whatever, and his car first tried to turn wrong side, you know, nose toward the wall. Well, and actually, he turned it back to the left. When I did it, it came out, you know, it comes sideways, and I'll never forget, because I mashed the radio button and told Hoss, you will not believe what I just saw. Yeah, that's what Hoss kept saying. <laughs> you will not believe what I just saw. This car, 3,800 pounds in, Jenny? 37. Turned over backwards. Yeah. Now, Brooks is going down the, the infield, apron or whatever, right beside me. I'm here going forward. And he's going backward, and this car turns over the wrong way. And I'm looking at the thing, and I said, I ain't believing it. <laughs> well, I, I watched him turn all the way over, and never did look like to me it landed hard on the roof. But then it started flipping. And that's I looked in the mirror, you know, on in the corner, and I couldn't believe, because all you could <clears> see was mud and grass and fenders and hoods flying everywhere. And, and I mashed the radio button again. I said, you can't believe what I just saw. I said, Brooks turned over the wrong way. Yeah, well, those cars, when they, I don't know, you know. I mean, I couldn't believe that, Darrell. That's the first time I'd ever yeah. saw one do when they, that. When they get, and they turn up the wrong yeah. way, I mean. No, this thing went over backwards, though. It, 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 wasn't, it was it absolutely wasn't backwards. backwards. It went this way. Rear bumper, same, rear same bumper person. going down the straightaway, it turned over backwards, just like a, a, a backflip like this. Yeah. yeah. That was the your deal at, at Daytona, wasn't it, too? During qualifying that day. He was qualified, yeah. Yeah, yeah he went yeah. backwards. Went backwards. He went backwards. He was yeah. going backwards and his pulled up. Bobby but Don Levy, Don Levy can, I think Don Levy can verify yeah. this. Yeah. Don Levy can verify this. That car flipped 15 or 16 times. And if I'm not mistaken, now this is Junior's claim to fame about all of his safety stuff and all this, <laughs> and his, and his uh, tanks that we all drove all down. If I'm not mistaken, three weeks later, didn't we run second at Dover in that same car? Yep. We were in that yeah, same right. car. We finished second at Dover. Yes, sir. And these guys now has got 25 cars. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you good about it. They still drive the same way, though. <laughs> you remember the, the big wreck at Talladega when Buddy was leading the race, you know, and the tire went down going through the trouble and everybody yeah. went oh, around. Yeah. Well, I, that was one of my first races. I was running for the Race Hill Farm Car, I believe. Hey, our cars are going everywhere down there, and I'm sort of picking my way through, doing pretty good. And all of a sudden, somebody hit me a little bit, and I spin around and go all the way down the first turn where like grass and that old metal guardrail is at. Hit the guardrail. A little bit later, here comes Kale flying in there, and he hit the guardrail, but there's a gap between our front wheels. And it had been a pretty good while since the wreck had been going, so Kale gets out, and I'm getting out over here. He walks up between the, my, the, my car and his car, and looking at the damage on the front end, by the time my tires are hollering, here comes somebody off the racetrack and hits Kale's car and knocks him in to my it's car. It's Marcus's car. Marcus. 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 Marcus.
he he's laying on the, he he laid on the ground there. there. Yeah. Look it up, and I run around and I said, you okay, Kale? He reaches up and grabs me, but the uniform, is my legs cut off? <laughs> <laughs> I I just, if I hadn't been standing in front of that tire, he'd have cut my legs yeah, off. The he wheel, the tire turned, the wheel turned. Right. He had it, crawled around my car to the window and yeah. was hollering at me to look to see if his legs was cut off because he kept saying, Dave, Dave, my legs is cut off. My legs it was numb. Off. You know, I thought it was gone. Yeah. I, I, said, I was scared to look. Okay. I said, Kale, you're fine. He said, I'm ruined. He grabbed me with a car and said, I'm ruined. I can't You've always been that high. You've always been that high. Eli Jr.'s got a good story about going out of a racetrack at, uh, on the old Northern Tour. Mm. Uh, one time went hiring a telephone pole and went out of the racetrack up there and uh, Where was that? Came, came to stop against a Coca-Cola stand, I think, outside and let Junior pick it up from there. It's a pretty amusing story. It's 65, me and Marvin Pants, and he's driving for Glenn and Leonard at that time. And we had, uh, I forget, I think Marvin had sat on a pole or I, anyway, we was both up front and we was in a heated battle, really going after it, you know. And I went down in the fourth turn, and the throttle hung on the old car. It hung one time before that day, and I told her about. I said that thing's hitting something there, and I, you got to fix it. He claimed he got it fixed, but he didn't. It got hung. <laughs> and we went in a turn, and that thing went straight on it. Hit the guardrail. It went up there like that, and come right down on the nose. And when it did. I had the brakes on the thing and it, and it you know, just flattened out and just about stopped because we hit the ground, it, you know, it almost hit straight down. And it just rolled about two or three foot. It hit a little, one of them Coca-Cola, little old trailers that pull, people get it and serves hot dogs and stuff. It shook that thing around, there's a woman inside of it, holding on, you know, to keep from falling out. I got out of there and walked around, and she's about eight or nine months pregnant. She said, Lord have mercy, I thought I was going to have this baby right <laughs> You and Sam was probably the most well-known car flying around, don't you think? Where's you that? And, you and oh. Sam McQuag there at Darlington. Oh, going out of Darlington? Yeah, yeah. that video has probably been seen by more folks. Yeah, and, yeah. it went completely out of, the, uh, out of the racetrack. Sam and I were battling for the lead, and, and we just, just barely touched going into turn one, and, and my car just got airborne. It just went straight up. Never touched the guardrail out out of the racetrack. It went and hit nose first, and then over in, landed upside of a telephone pole outside of uh, out in, in the parking lot. That was quite a ride. But let me tell you something about Junior Johnson. <laughs> there there are pictures that document Junior Johnson running the modifieds on the beach course in Daytona on the old road in the in the beach course of Junior's modified flipping through one of the corners. Well, Junior is standing outside of the race car on the racetrack and the car is still flipping. That's documented. That's, that, 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 that's a fact. I've seen the pictures and I've seen, seen him standing there watching that car still rolling. How he got out of it, nobody ever knows. But Junior and I, Junior, <laughs> called, Junior, Junior called me one afternoon and he says, uh, said, I got a friend that wants you to go down to Charleston with me and, and open up a uh, uh, parts house he's got down there and I said his name was McNeil, Gwen McNeil and he said we'll pick you up in, uh, in Timbersville the little old dirt strip there and uh, at some time of day we're going down and do the thing come back and I said alright I'll be fine so Junior and McNeil flew in that afternoon I got an airplane brand new airplane I mean a beautiful twin engine Piper and, and uh, went down to the, to the uh, opening for the new store down there Everything went great. Coming back, it was it was dark, and uh, had been raining a little bit. And uh, McNeil lined up. He was an airline pilot, but he lined up for the you know, little old strip in Timbersville. You know, I flew. it, been flying in in and out of there since I was 15 years old, and that's where my airplane was, and I knew it like the back of my hand. It was about 3,000 foot grass strip, and McNeil lined up to come in there, and I said, Junior was in the back. And I was sitting in the co-pilot seat, and McNeil was flying it. So I said, uh, Mac, I said, you're a little bit high, and you need, to, you need to go around. A little bit too high, a little bit too fast. Oh, no. I got it. Got it made. So he kept on coming. I said, Mac, I said, you're a little bit high, and you're a little, 
a little bit too fast. I said, you need to go around. I said, ain't nobody him but us. This is a short place. You don't know it. it, it, won't, it, it it's not embarrassing to go around one time, you know. Oh, no, I'm going to make it. Well, I knew we wasn't going to make it, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't do nothing about it. And it came down. We was about halfway down that, down that grass strip, still running about 150 miles an hour, still 10 feet off the ground. Wasn't no way to get it stopped if you got it on the ground. So we finally, he just planted on the ground. They had some construction bulldozers and stuff sitting out there, and the plane turned sideways, and we was running 150 miles an hour sideways, headed towards a great big old hangar. And those bulldozers, that bulldozer looked like hotels out there, didn't it? Jimmy? Went, <laughs> went, went by that thing. But finally, the gear broke out from under it, the wing folded up under it, and the, the dust was flying, and it finally stopped. Junior Johnson was standing in the middle of the airstrip before that airplane ever stopped. <laughs> and he was in the back. That's the true story, file. And, and, and he, was, he was already out of that airplane, came out of the back, already out of the airplane, standing in the middle of the airstrip before the ever thing ever quit turning over. <laughs> so I, how he got out of that race car in Daytona and how he got out of that airplane in Timmonsville, I don't know. But he, he, so, Junior, how did you he, get how did you out? How did you do it, Junior? Huh? How did you do first, it? First at Daytona. <laughs> Kale was, he was opening the door and getting out and says, come on, Junior, get out of this thing, go catch the fire. I said, get over there, Walt. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> you were standing right there in the middle of the river. <laughs> did you get out or did you fall out? Oh, oh my God. Oh, oh, oh God. It's headed right towards the bull. <laughs> the blade is turned. I, it's going to hit it head up. <laughs> it stopped about two or three feet on it. Mario Rossi bought a brand new plane. Y'all remember him. And Bondi had a strip down there behind his house, you know, in Camden. But uh, Mario had a brand new plane, and, and he didn't know. He, evidently, he didn't know about the strip. And he's coming down there to show off his plane, you know. And we was all standing out front there, and, and Bondi was looking at him, you know. He never cussed or nothing. He said, wonder what that joker's doing there. When he turned left, you know, and then turned on final and started down, he's coming right down on the road in front of <coughs> Bondi's house instead of the strip, you know. And Bondi said, oh, go on, I believe that joker's going to land. He just, he just bought this plane. And then that thing touched down on the road and started taking down the mailboxes. And, <laughs> and, all. and they had, I mean, it went right on out in the field. And they had to send the FAA and the truck and everything down there and haul it off. I Pull guess you guys had some different times with the aircraft over Baker the years, huh? Oh, Lord. Yeah. Now you really Let me tell you about a time that Bobby Allison had. Hey, I asked yeah. Bobby about the first time we went dove hunting down in Verbena when he was flying his little Mooney when he first got his license. And we landed in that crop nurse's field. Hey, it was a plenty big field. I just <laughs> landed on the airplane there. I with him, I know. The, uh, the book said that uh, for a short field, it would get off in 800, 850 feet. Yeah, but it didn't And we had at least 875. With a power line over the other end <laughs> and a bunch of trees on the other end of it. And that, that crop duster plane probably had a lot more horsepower because it was so, it had a ditch in it. And then about three quarters of the way down, there was a power line. You had to go over the ditch, under the power line, and then up before you hit the trees at the other end. <laughs> and, uh, we made it, didn't we? Yeah, but we, now, we got out and pushed the plane with a tail back into the woods at the other end before he got started. We needed that extra foot, and he pushed the tail all the way back in the woods. And then, we, man, he revved that thing, went up through there, hit that ditch, went under that power line, and went up. When he did, the leaves was coming off the trees when we went up that <laughs> other side like that thing. Well, I, I'll tell you one better than that. We... Uh, we left Bessemer Airport, the old airport at Bessemer, going to Martinsville, Virginia to race. Bobby and me, Don Lawrence, a fellow that worked for Bobby, and, and Judy. And we took off out of Bessemer, and right away it started to get where well, you couldn't see where you were going. So uh, the guy in Birmingham on the radio told Bobby it'd be all right. He got on up a little bit. It was fine. Well, the further north we got, the worse it got. And when you get up by Anniston, Alabama, Talladega up in that area, there's pretty big mountains. Well, Bobby naturally starts up. And I promise you, that Mooney's not very wide, the wingspan. I couldn't see the little light on the end of the wing. Well, he calls Atlanta, and we didn't have a transponder or anything at that time. So the guy in Atlanta made us turn for radio, uh, you know, for radar identification. So we did, and 
and we're flying along there, and, and the guy come back on the radio and told Bobby that if he went down 1,500 feet, he'd be in a clear. Well, all this time that this is going on, I'm sitting in the right seat, and at that time, I, I did smoke. Well, I had a Zippo cigarette lighter, and I'd strike that cigarette lighter. I was holding it in my lap, and I'd light it like that, and I'd put it out, you know, close the top. So we got all out in the clear anyway. We get to Martinsville, or we're flying along there, and Bobby looks at me and says, I want to ask you a question. Why were you lighting that cigarette lighter? I said, Bobby, that flame burns up. It won't burn down. If that plane had been upside down, that flame was going back in that cigarette lighter, I'd turn that baby over. <laughs> <laughs> but I will have to say this. Regardless of what they say about him, he's as good a pilot as ever flown one. Yep. And after he got hurt so bad and everything and got his license back, people questioned, will, will you fly with Bobby? I said, I'll fly anywhere with him, anytime. And, you know, anybody, everybody here has probably flew with him sometime or other, uh, except David. David says, I'm not going to fly with you, but you can use my airplane. So <laughs> Bobby and I jumped in David's uh, 310, and off we went. You remember that day when you loaned us 310? You guys must have had some great trips, Barney. You and David? We had a few. <laughs> <laughs> I like Pearson's philosophy on bad weather flying and bad weather. He used to tell me, I'd say, well, you know, we can, we can make it. And he'd say, son, takeoffs are optional. Landings are mandatory. <laughs> okay? I'll tell you a story about Barney. Barney's a <clears throat> pretty well-rounded guy, and he's done a lot of stuff. He uh, dives and swims and all that stuff when he was young and what have you. And we went, uh, there's a guy named Claude Horton that taught David and I both to fly. And, uh, and he used to fly with us a lot, going back and forth to the races. <clears throat> David had an old Aztec and uh, pretty good old airplane. And we, we took off to Michigan one time. Well, every time we ever went to Michigan, somewhere we'd get hung up in weather. There would be a line of weather somewhere between Spartanburg and Michigan. So anyway, we were going along. And this time we were way up in Ohio or up toward Ohio. And the weather was getting worse and worse and worse. David flying. And he just, I believe he had just got his instrument ticket. Just had to, maybe, maybe didn't even have quite have it yet. Claude was... Still working with him, but you know, we're going along, and Barney's been telling me all the way up there. I don't know Barney all that well, but Barney's been telling me about the life he's had. <clears throat> he got to do a lot of diving. He's been around the world. He's been military stuff or whatever he was in, and and got to do all the racing and such. And that, you know, nobody really wants to go, but if it was his time, you know, he's felt that he's got a full life. And and we're talking about this for an hour, hour and a half. And Barney's got me pretty well convinced that he's probably. You know, other than saying his last goodbyes, he's probably ready to go if things was to happen, you know? Well, we're getting bad. We get weather gets worse and worse and worse. And after a while, we're in a mess, and the center, I heard the center turn us loose, and lightning hit the plane. And, a, and if you guys ever been in an airplane where lightning hits, you got little beads of fire flying around the windows and all that stuff, you know, and when it grounds it. And we were really in, in a fair bit of trouble. <laughs> I mean, and. Anyway, so as we finally make a turn, the first thing I see is lightning hits a water tower right off the end of the runway there at, uh, at uh, Jackson, Michigan. And it was bad. I don't know how bad it was at that time because I hadn't flown that much. But to me, it was, it was pretty bad. We were well, evidently, it was pretty bad to Barney because he had scratched the windows. <laughs> he had dug holes in the seats and everything. And Barney was not quite ready to go yet. <laughs> Not that day. I didn't have a ticket. <laughs> Not that day, anyway. <laughs> knocked the radios and things out. Yeah, knocked the radios out and everything. Yeah. Kel Yarbrough had an unusual passenger in a plane from uh, yep. North Wilkesboro to Timmonsville hey, one time. Tell us that story. Thanks, yeah. thanks to Junior's <laughs> Junior, boys. Yeah, exactly. yeah uh, <coughs> you know, Junior lives up in the mountains up there, and, uh, and I'd always wanted me a, a little cub, you know, a bear. To raise, and so I told Junior, I said, if you ever run across one, you know, hang on to him and to him, and and uh, I'll come get him. So he called me one day, and he says, I got your bear. And I said, All right, where, where, where you got him? He said, Well, he's up in a box. And so I got in the airplane right by myself and took off. I said, I'll be there in a little bit. Went up there, and sure enough, he had him sitting out like about a sixty-pound cub sitting there in a wooden box, ready to go. So I put him in the airplane and uh, didn't put him in the luggage compartment, put him in the back seat back there where he'd have plenty, plenty of room, you know, because... Yeah. Being the gracious host. Yeah, that oh yeah, the there. box, I wanted him to see where he was going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the box uh, was a pretty, pretty good, looked to me like a good wooden box, a cage, you know. So uh, we took off to Timmonsville, just me and the bear, and... Uh, <clears throat> 
I, I got uh, got to Timmonsville, and uh, before I got to Timmonsville, I got to looking back at that uh, box back there, and uh, I could see the bear was gnawing on that thing. You know, he didn't like that flying too much, and and he just kept gnawing and kept gnawing. I said, man, I'm going to be in trouble here if that scale gnaws out of that box before I get home. <laughs> But he didn't. He, I went in. For the, I, I didn't circle the airport or nothing. I went straight in <laughs> and landed and got on the ground. But I'll tell you what, the box, the bear didn't know it, but he was already out of the box. He, all he had to do was lean on it. He'd already gnawed completely, <laughs> completely through that thing. And uh, I don't know whether that bear could fly that airplane or not, but uh, he, he'd have probably had control of it. For <laughs> <a little. laughs> There's a prelude to that story. Uh -huh. Henry Benfield had gotten that bear for uh, Junior, and Junior had it up there at the place and uh, had it set up in this sort of like cage and noticed that uh, the bear's paw was cut or damaged or something like that. So he'd gone to the vet, got this big jar of blue antiseptic. And he fashioned this coat hanger with the cotton and everything on the end of it and dipped it in that antiseptic and he was gonna put it on that bear's paw. Now for some reason, Junior was bare chested. <laughs> So he's got the bottle in one hand and he's looking and he's trying to line up that bear and just as he pokes that stick in there with the cotton, the bear goes and lunges at him. And Junior falls back and that entire bottle of blue antiseptic <laughs> dumped all over him. And he said, damn you Henry, come here and get this bear. It took him six months to get that off his skin. <laughs> Did the bear ever fly again? Uh, no. The bear never flew Susan again though. Where's the bear now? The bear, I, I raised him, had a, had a big big cage for him, and it could lead him around on a rope, you know, it was, turned into a pet. But, uh, you know, things like that get so big, you get afraid he's going to hurt somebody. And uh, so I gave him to the zoo in Myrtle, Myrtle Beach. He's still down there at Brook Green Garden Zoo at Myrtle Beach. Uh, you go by and see your son every so often? <laughs> <laughs> it was a she. <laughs> it, was a daughter. it was a daughter. <laughs> I got an airplane story, even though people w wouldn't realize they had airplanes back when I was first started driving race cars. Back in uh, around 57, 58, and I was chasing points all over the country in, in the sportsman division, they call it Bush Grand National now, but anyway, they had a race at Greensboro, North Carolina on a Saturday night, and one at Richmond, Virginia on a Saturday afternoon at the fair. And I wasn't going to be able to get back from Richmond to Greensboro in time to catch. It was a double feature at, at Greensboro that night, so I said, I can get me a lot of points. So I had a buddy that uh, ran the Chevrolet dealership, the one that Dale Earnhardt has now. And he had, there were five of them in together that had a little single engine airplane. And he said, let me fly you up there and, uh, and I'll fly you back to Greensboro. So that sounded like a good idea. So we went up there and ran the race at Richmond and just Five laps to go, it started sprinkling rain. Well, we got the race in, rushed over to the airport, and they said, well, the further south you go, the better the weather is. No problem. So I got in the back, I was tired, and, and was uh, sort of dozing off, and he got up, and the further south we got, the worse the weather got. He kept getting down, getting down. He didn't have any instruments, and getting under the clouds. And finally, he woke me up, and he said, Ned said, uh, said I hate for you to miss that race, but said, might have to set this thing down. I said, hey, don't take any chances if I miss that race, okay. And so I dozed off again, and he woke me up in a little bit, and he said, okay, get up and fasten your seatbelt. He said, I found a place to set it down. And I thought he'd found an airstrip. And he circled around, and it was a cornfield. And this was in September, so the corn was full grown. He couldn't tell if it was new ground or what it was, you know, stumps in there or whatever. But anyway, he said, there's where I'm going to put her. So he circled around, and he made his approach, and right in, just pouring down rain then and hit the ground and, and that thing just mowed the corn down out through there, their ear, the corn ears and everything just flying in every direction and got right to the end of the cornfield and there was a ditch about waist deep and the plane just tilted over right down in it. It looked like it had come out of the sky and, and went four or five feet down into the ground. Yeah. Well, he was just as calm as he could be and, he, and we got out of the airplane. He said, God damn it, said, aren't you afraid? I said, no, Eddie, we're, I'm not afraid. He said, we just crashed an airplane. I said, you didn't tell me to be afraid. You told me to get up and fasten my seatbelt. You're just going to set it down. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> and uh, the people were coming by the highway. As it turned out, we were near Alta Vista, Virginia. Highway 29 was 600 yards from where we were. Of course, it was a busy road, so I guess it didn't want to land on that. But uh, people were thinking, you know, there was that airplane in the ground, and those people were dead. <laughs> and, uh, but went into town, had to make out a report to the police station, had one taxi in town, and I was trying to inquire how I was going to get from there to Greensboro. It wasn't, but about an hour from there. And uh, so uh, the taxi was on duty, taking some, one somewhere, so we had to wait till he came back and uh, did get 
two Greensboro, caught the second feature, and won that second feature that night. So got some points out of the deal. That's a good story. Talk to me about, we have so many new fans in the sport, Glenn. A lot of folks don't know about the Wood Brothers tradition. Uh, I guess one of the biggest stories, obviously, is when you guys first went to Indianapolis and all. What was that like back in those days? Well, it was, it was all new to us. Uh, we had no idea where it was going. Uh, Ford Motor Company, John Cowley, asked me, how about going to Indianapolis? And I said, what for? He says, to pit Jimmy Clark. I said, are you serious? And he says, well, as a matter of fact, I am. So we went up there, and, uh, and the whole crew just worked on the car to get it so you could pit it, because that had been their problem. And Leonard was doing this with the nozzles and everything to get them so they'd work. And, and we went up there and pitted it, and I believe we had uh, 19 seconds and 21, which is the, the least total time ever spent in the pits there, and never changed the tire and won the race. What was it like when you guys first walked in? What did the, uh, what did the Indy car set think of you boys coming up from uh, Stewart and uh, trying to show them how it was done? Well, Leonard could probably tell that a little better than I can. Get him on that. Um, first of all, I'd like to say that A.J. Fort was driving for us, you know, uh, in several races. And so when we walk in, we see him. He, so he's immediately showing us around all his car, how it's made, how the exact, uh, gas tank's made, and he's got an extra tank, you know, and telling us all about it. He says, oh, what y'all doing up here? And I says, uh, we up here to... Pitt Clark, and of course I'm not going to tell you what he said, but uh, <laughs> it was a family video. But huh? when we went into the uh, English shop, uh, and you know it's a foreign team, you know, and but they accept us with open arms and didn't give us any trouble at all or any resentment, you know. Had not could that been change, could well, no, it was English, but had not that been the case, you couldn't have, you wouldn't have wanted to do it, but. <laughs> they act like they welcomed us there, and so uh, it worked out real well. Let's stay on the international deal a second here. Junie, when you and uh, Brooks, when you guys went to Lamar, what was that like? Well, we, that, was, that was quite a trip because uh, uh, they had never seen the cars like this, or full-bodied cars over there before. And the way we were running in those days, uh, without restrictor plates and stuff, our cars would run like on the Mulsane, which is a four and a half mile straight away, and kind of off through the woods. Well, our cars would run in the 220, 215, 220 range, if, you know, so they so were pretty quick. We were, we were basically as quick as the little Europeans' cars were. Of course, we'd start stopping three quarters of the way down there, and those guys go all the way to the corner and stop mm -hmm. and turn, you know, and so, and take it off is about the same way, but they've got a... When we, when we got ready to go to inspection or scrutineering, they call it there, they don't do it at the racetrack. You just drive your cars to the racetrack there. You, can, you don't have to be at the racetrack. You can be downtown working on them or, or, or a guy's house or wherever. And when it comes to time to practice, you just drive it out to the racetrack. Well, we were driving this car down to, uh, to where they were doing the inspection, down behind the governor's house, and a uh, big, big deal. I mean, it's, a, you know, three quarters of a million people in, in uh, in the uh, early 70s. That's a lot of people race crowd, you know. So we're going along through and the traffic gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Finally, we just have to stop and get out and they ended up pulling their cars down there. Well, when we come back, <clears throat> we're in an impound sort of area and, uh, and Junie is going to take it and go get some gas in it. He's going to drive it over to gas pumps and get some gas. And uh, he's not gone very long, he comes back. And they scared him. The people got was all over the hood, and they were on the trunk, and they were on the deck lid, and they were they were everywhere. So they scared him. He wasn't he wasn't getting back out of that impound. He was going back in there and get a guard, and go get some gas or something. Kind of bizarre journey, was it? Oh, I'm telling you, when all those people converged on that car, I mean, they just cut off everything but really the air that you would breathe. Well, they just never seen that stuff. But anyway, what when we go up, we, we get ready to go practice, and they've got a really good intercom system around that racetrack, or relatively good anyway, and. Uh, so we get ready to go practice, and now that racetrack, for the, for the guys that haven't seen it here, you, there is a racing surface in the front where the grandstand and stuff are. And then you go up on the main highway, <laughs> right up on the highway, and you go all the way down to the next town, and then you turn and go through a little settlement, a couple little towns, and then you turn back. And as you come back, you get back up on that little race course there for half mile, three quarters of a mile, whatever it is, in front of the grandstand. Well, in the back, there was no guardrails. 
It was just a two-lane road, no shoulders, no guardrails, no nothing, just trees and, uh, uh, you know, buildings, stores and stuff back there. And uh, uh, Economac, he tells a good story about somebody that was down there with them, and they said something about it. He was riding down through there, and he said, well, I bet you guys take off a good carry of drivers over here and all that stuff. And the guy said, you know, said, what do you mean? He said, well, you'd have a lot of trouble getting one through all them trees to get to them people, you know. <laughs> so, and that's about the way it was. But anyway, we go up on it up on the race course, off the race course, and get up on that road. And I'm humming down through there, and it's just amazing, the people. I just, I just can't believe the amount of people. And they're standing alongside the road, not alongside the road. So I'm breezing down through there, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 mile an hour. And, uh, and so the next time we come up, I go around, the next time I come up, I'm gonna make a lap and, uh, and take off down through there. Well, I'm up humping. Well, they're used to these little cars. The driver's head's only that high, you know, and they're meow, 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 and they're going to breaking all that wind. And they're out, on the, they're out on the runway. They're out on the driveway, out on the, out on the road. And I swear to God, they're standing on the road. You can't see through them. They're standing on the road way down there. And as you're coming, they just start parting, step back off the shoulder of the road, and you run right through them. <laughs> well, there again, they're used to these little bitty cars. Well, here I go through there the first time, and of course it's hard to picture, it's hard to describe this to somebody unless you can just see it yourself. But if you've ever had a double-edged plow, you ever pulled a double-edged plow through nice fresh dirt, that's the way them people looked as I went through them. I mean, <laughs> you look in the mirror and they were just laying them back. Man. <laughs> they were just laying back, they were falling around, everything was flying around. Next time I come down through there, you could see heads and arms and Everything sticking out, everything, but everybody's behind a tree someplace. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, Eli, when I when I ran, we ran a Camaro over there, mm -hmm. Billy Hagen and I, and, and and he's right about the people, you know. But but they, they cleared it up a little bit uh, since since he had been there. But the people down that long back stretch, what's the name of it? Bolsing. Bolsing. It's four and a half miles. You know, yeah. you run two hundred fifty miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, down that thing, and, and the people will be sitting right by it with the tables and the, yeah, sitting and they'll be right. sitting right there. And so help me, the wine glasses would have had white caps in it. When you go by the square, <laughs> the wine glasses would have white caps in it. But they'd sit right there. Look, guys, we've done another hour and ten minutes, so why don't we uh, break at this point and. Uh... Well, he, he got, he got uh, a double header tomorrow he, night. He's bigger than I ever seen him in my life. Oh, he yeah, yeah, still driving. I met huh? You still driving? Yeah. He was a little skinny thing. You won any races lately? I haven't run any lately. I ran third in a qualified. Well, I mean, when you did. Talladega tomorrow night. There's a little short track out there. Oh, we're going to run a lot of track. Oh, yeah. You're talking about the one right next to the big track? Yeah. You ain't seen nothing. Saturday night. Night. Yeah, you gonna run your gold car or is that thing tore all up? No, I messed that thing up last week and that 50 Lamper had that town day. <laughs> Somebody backed it to me going down the straightaway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody backed it to you going down the straightaway like he, that? He, he, had, he, had, he had gold. He took me over and showed him he had one of my gold uh, dirt car, wing car, you know, with a body made like a wing and all that stuff. And, oops. What are you doing, Ty? And I'm telling a story on Red. Hey, you can tell the stories later now, but make sure you're I took, it, I took it over, he took me over and showed me this nice new car and all that stuff. And I looked at it real good and walked around the back and tore my damn pants <laughs> back. <laughs> I said, that's good, that's Red Farmer's car. It's got snags all over it. <laughs> uh, well, I told him, I said, I've never seen a purse yet that they paid extra money for he pretty cars. You mean the guy backed right into you? Yeah, back to me going down the straightaway. Well, tore the nose up, pushed the radiator in his pants. I guarantee you, all Red's pictures, the first First thing they had to do to be on Red Farm Pit Crew is go get a tetanus shot. <laughs> I heard that. Somebody told me you had to have a tetanus shot to shoot the timing on it. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's true, but. I think that was about pretty tall. Yeah, all pretty in my circle. I it. I built it. Don't tell me. I built it for you. I go over there and I climb up and he's a little buddy two car garage on the house, man. I was in there and we made this aluminum chute. Yeah. And he flopped that leg over and his gas pedal was always over on the right hand side. That's where he was trying to look transmissions. And uh, <laughs> that's good. He put that cast in that thing and it won't work good. And he, he said, man, this thing won't work with nothing. I turned around and looked and there was a can of big loops in there, open can of big loops. 
I said, wait a minute, Red, I'll fix it. And I poured that big lube in there, man, it slid up now. He's that's just what it needs to be. So every night he got in that thing, he poured a little bigger lube under that cast. You know, it's like STP, but it was called bigger lube. Slide it up now. And, it, it, and, like and I mean, it, 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 that's the way it worked. I wonder how you made that thing work. He didn't. Had to put your leg in it. No, we had a cable. What it did to rig the cable. He had a cast on under from here down. What he they had, knee, but he couldn't what they did, Leonard, they had a cable running off the accelerator linker down to a pulley and run across in front of that trough. And all I do is push in on the cable and open the throttle up and back off and push. I had to push my legs, slide it up and down because I couldn't work my foot. So I slid it up and down. There and he's trying to work a regular gas. <laughs> well, see, I didn't work at his shop. I worked at another place. So he called me on the phone. He said, come over here. I need some help. So I went over there. And I looked in there and seen what he was trying to do. I said, we need to build a trough for that thing, Red. So I built an aluminum trough. <laughs> and put the heel in it. And he slid this cast, you know, the heel of his cast down in there. And he went to work, he said, it won't slide. <laughs> and I looked out the window and I saw that big loop sitting there. I said, I can fix it where it slid, did it? I poured that big loop in that trough and well, did you win? Yeah, we won some races. We, were, we was running fuel injected cars at that time. We were running fuel injectors and stuff on the thing. The old well, I can coops. tell you what, I can tell you, you talk about when. 1992, uh, 62, we ran 106 races, the three of us, and between the three of us won 96 of them. Not bad. That's where they started the dead Alabama game stuff, because we'd run one, two, three to a lot of places, many places. Well, Bristol. that was the thing that was bad. It Remember two, three, we went to Bristol, you, you, and, and that's where we built those sedans, and yeah, nobody ever seen sedans, sedans and we qualified one, two, three, and then there was about 50-something coops behind us, and we had them sedans that ran one, two, three at Bristol, and the, I went uh, at Bobby Rensacker. Y'all used them old coaches, and y'all yeah. had tops in like that, you yeah. used them as spoilers. Yeah. Well, at that time, we didn't know about that. Plus, I didn't put mine on there. We built them actually just to be different from everybody else, because they had coops. I don't ever know when thing But y'all kept them. You know, you know, what, I, right you know what I wanted, man? I want a man who I can match that gas pedal harder than you could. See, the uh, coach, uh, the, the top, you know, being that far back, you know, it give it a weight transfer, too. Yeah. 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 You get a lot of weight transfer. That's well, the only thing I can argue right. about that was Bob, we had sedan, me and him, and Bobby had a coupe, and Bobby won just damn many races yeah. everybody else did. Wait a minute, guys, let me ask you something. Did you ever see that thing that, that his brother run, where he sat on the left rear tire? <laughs> yeah, I see. I see. Uh, he oh. sat in the back window of that thing, and it had a steering Tim shaft Clark. that went from the Tim middle Clark part of that race Tim car didn't try got that We yeah. stayed back Tim one of our like that on the beach. Had the engine seat. Looking at a little small window, and his head would be right there where yeah. the little window's at. I got it from him. That's the first one I ever like seen. 36 or 39 yeah. Chevrolet Coupe. Uh, 39 Chevrolet. Yeah, 39 Chevrolet. Tim, yeah, I Joe, remember him running. I ran against Joe him that time. Sitting in the back seat driving yeah. that thing. Hey, I know about a 37 Ford Coupe. Man got in that back seat. He started backing out of the shop, you know, and and you're sitting all the way in the back, you know, you have no uh, distance to judge the, yeah. the the way which way it's going, you know. And he he says he said, now how in the world am I going to drive this? <laughs> but he had a long distance from where he was the steering wheel out over the hood, and uh, it, he was going to win the first race and uh, got in a little accident. Now you better go get your makeup. We start in 15 minutes. They had, you work out. Yeah, you go up, up there. there. They're going to take a four inch paint for us and do him. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to ruin the roller. What about the roller? The roller. The roller. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, roller. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't you have been made up? No. You, you got to go up the steps right here. Right Is that up in this right corner here? here. <laughs> do I look made up? A few weeks after taping these videos, Dick Beatty passed away. We dedicate these videos to his memory.